Alex told me to rebuild the Lord's house. I, I thought I had to work with stone and mortar, but perhaps I was wrong. Was I wrong? Perhaps you were. Hello, welcome back everyone. Canto 11 of Paradiso today. It's a beautiful canto, one of the most maybe iconic cantos of the Divine Comedy, especially of Paradiso, because it's a, a canto where St. Thomas will present St. Francis in uh, something of a, a geography where he really celebrates the life of St. Francis. And uh, as I discussed in the previous video, this is uh, to be seen as a in, in context, in the top context of uh, Canto 10, 11 and 12, which is a very structured program by Dante. Um, it's a, um, certainly a, an easier canto to read and uh, it doesn't really present uh, all the difficulties, the technical difficulties that the previous canto presented. It, it reads a little bit uh, quicker and faster. Of course, uh, Dante put the usual incredible care in crafting the canto and there is a lot of uh, current and uh, previous literature that went into this canto as a source, in particular Franciscan literature. So we can really get started with this canto and uh, we remember that we are still in the fourth heaven, the heaven of the sun, the circle of the sun. Um, Dante starts uh, with uh, some comments and thoughts of his own and then give space to St. Thomas again to read his mind, read especially two particular questions that are going around Dante's heart and Dante's mind, and then he launches into another uh, monologue, we can call it. First, he, uh, he will answer one of these two questions and he will give the answer by the end of this canto. And for the answer to the second question, the, the question related to Solomon, we're going to have to wait until Canto 13. So let's get started. Uh, the initial uh, thoughts by Dante are uh, all concerning uh, earthly anxieties. Uh, and this is certainly a perfect uh, introduction to think of uh, St. Francis, who symbolized in history the detachment from earthly anxieties. The way that Dante does it, he talks about different professions. Now, I noticed that there have been different ways to present this, and uh, the Dante scholar Teodolinda Barolini, she talks about uh, Paradiso 11 as uh, a canto where Dante views professional aspirations as burdensome concerns. And I think this is maybe a little too strong of a statement because Dante is not presenting to us professional different professions as burdensome in themselves. He's really talking about uh, uh, people, normal people, who have a lot of worries and anxieties, a little bit the character of the rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. That's what he's talking about. When he talks about an insensata cura, which is the first line of the canto, he talks really about worry, he's talking about anxiety, rather than a normal care, which is in fact what uh, Mandelbaum translated, translates it into, senseless cares of mortal. We need to be careful because the difference is subtle, but I think there is a little bit of difference. So these defective syllogismi are this logistic reasoning, but they are defective, which means they are mistaken. They are mistaken reasonings that um, make human beings fly low, be very low to the earth, while we are made for great things. We, with our wings, we can fly very high. But this type of mistaken reasoning, and they are mistaken, especially in their premises. One perfect example of, uh, a modern example of these mistaken uh, reasonings would be somebody on YouTube who is making videos for you to become a millionaire or billionaire. How to become a millionaire in uh, six months. That is a perfect example of a, a mistaken syllogism to project all of your desires and anxieties towards uh, something that is uh, completely earthly. Now Dante makes a list of the various uh, earthly items. Chi dietro aiura, which is law studies. Chi ad amphorismi, he's talking about studies in um, medicine. Sengiva, 
e chi seguendo sacerdozio is uh, in fact talking about uh, the clergy who is uh, going after who one was set on priesthood so it's true that this is what Dante is saying but only thinking about somebody who is after the priesthood doesn't really explain the meaning that Dante wants to give here because then it would mean that he's criticizing everybody who's just becoming a priest and that's not the case he is really criticizing the, the mundane the mundane aspect of the priesthood in his times how the clergy many of them were after power after money of course and benefits e chi regnar per forza o per sofismi somebody who's after power regnar means to to have power or to rule through force or fraud through violence or or fraud e chi rubare somebody stealing e chi civil negozio or public administration here um, Mandelbaum says uh, she says one meant to plunder one to politic ck and in any case we we get the point here somebody is uh, nel diletto della carne is uh, just involved in the pleasures of the flesh and somebody is completely in ozio doing nothing just uh, being uh, very slothful when uh, i dante i am looking at he's really giving us the perspective of of him looking down from the sun from that altitude looking down and i'm sholto i'm libero i'm i'm free literally it's as if he, as he was looking down at us from there con beatrice with beatrice cotanto gloriosamente with uh, so much glory saint thomas here is uh, reading dante's mind and uh, expressing in words the two big doubts that dante has the first one is uben simpingua verse 25 and this is actually referring to the previous canto canto 10 uh, where um, saint thomas said uh, uben simpingua se non si vaneggia at verse 96 of uh, canto 10 and uh, well, while he was talking about uh, the dominicans he was basically implying some reservations about the corrupt nature of the order of the dominicans to which he himself belonged the second one is la udissi where i said non nacque il secondo and he's referring to the the concept of the preeminence of solomon that saint thomas had also um, stated in his uh, monologue in fact on verse uh, 110 and 111 in canto 10. so very simply and very directly saint thomas tells dante i'm going to explain and provide clarity to you here and therefore we can consider his real monologue and expl explanation to start from verse 28 of the canto where uh, he says la provvidenza che governa il mondo the providence that rules the world with, vis with wisdom that every type of intelligence human intelligence or angelic intelligence is uh, beaten or is, is beat is won over no intelligence is able to get to the bottom of it of the divine providence this uh, long sentence that starts uh, with verse 28 and ends around verse uh, 39 or 40 is uh, a grammatically convoluted sentence where dante is talking about uh, the divine providence having generated uh, two princes and and uh, saint thomas is talking about uh, saint francis and saint dominic però che andasse ver lo suo diletto la sposa di colui the bride of him is the church so there is an ecclesiological purpose and program here that dante is following and this is the re-inflaming and the reinvigorating of the energy of the church thanks to these two princes this is what the divine providence providence has done in uh, in the century before dante because uh, both saint francis and saint dominic lived about maybe 50 to 60 years before dante so these movements these orders were in fact uh, fairly young and recent relative to dante's life the purpose of sending these two princes by the providence is the one to make the church not only more energetic but also in se sicura i'm reading verse 34 which means sure about herself the church e anche a lui più fida meaning more even more um, f faithful to jesus uh, 
uh, in uh, therefore there is a a matter of uh, already dividing the chores dividing the responsibilities between these two saints because they are so complementary with each other and uh, dante explains or saint thomas explains quinci e quindi on one side and the other of the church they will be guiding her forward l'un fu tutto serafico in ardore this is saint francis he was all seraphic in his ardor of course the seraphims are the highest the angels of the highest orders the ones who are in the imperium but the, the reason why dante is using uh, seraphico here is because they represent charity and love and this is really the strength the charisma of uh, saint francis l'altro saint, saint dominic per sapienza in terra fui di cherubica luce in the other one saint dominic was splendid in uh, on earth for another characteristic or, or element which was his uh, wisdom or his knowledge so we have two aspects that are very different but also very complementary with each other and we can with modern uh, examples very easily think about uh, our current pope and our current pope emeritus so pope francis on one hand and emeritus pope uh, uh, benedict the 16th who also in themselves for their personalities and their charismas represent loosely speaking this type of characteristics pope francis a lot of charity love and that type of uh, seraphic personality and pope benedict who is one of the best theologians uh, for my limited theology readings in fact the best theologian of the 20th century so refined and uh, deep and profound here saint thomas is being very careful uh, about not putting one saint on top of the other he is also very clearly stating that uh, he's going to speak about one before the other simply because you have to choose in uh, in the series but they really are working towards the same the same goal and the the ways to reach god in fact in uh, saint benedict in uh, pope benedict 16th uh, words uh, are as many as there are human beings on earth then starting with uh, verse uh, 43 we have a perfect example of uh, dante being a um, cinematographer who is following the example of virgil uh, the we, so we could call this virgilian cinematography here from verse 43 to 47 48 where if this was a movie we could see the side of the mountain and the hills and then the focus finally on the village or the town where saint francis was born that is called assisi it's even more beautiful here because dante is comparing assisi and the, the birth of saint francis um, to the ascension of the sun in the sky at uh, dawn and, and this is in fact this comparison of saint francis to the birth of the sun in the early day is um identification between saint francis and the sun that had been done already often in the franciscan literature so between the death of saint francis to the moment when dante wrote this this is not a completely or fully original idea by dante somebody who wrote about this for example was saint, bon saint bonaventure and uh, even in the apocalypse in the book seven of uh, apocalypse we have something that probably dante used to as an inspiration which is the angel rising from the east and this verse where dante says nacque al mondo un sole come fa questo talvolta di gange the gange the river gange was uh, in dante's imag imagination the farthermost uh, east location on earth the effects of the sun on the earth are always very beneficial and the effects of saint francis being born on the earth uh, didn't really have to wait a long time to show their benefits uh, around him and this is this is what he's saying verse 55 is the verse where this big love story that is at the center of canto 11 starts and uh, it takes us a little bit uh, unprepared the first time that we read it because we are reading about a love story and so we almost expect it to have the typical connotations of a love story and it does until we understand 
what really St. Thomas, St. Thomas is talking about is the, the loved one, the beloved one of St. Francis. It's not actually a woman, but it's an allegory and it's Lady Poverty. It's talking about poverty. The first time he mentions her is on verse 58. Per tal donna, for such woman. We are expecting a woman here, but it's actually poverty. In Guerra del Padre Corsi, he was at war with his father. There is a little bit of uh, warlike language that Dante uses and uh, maybe a heroic tone. There is something that gets often lost and missed in the English translation, which is at verse 60. Dante says, La porta del piacer nessun di serra. Mandelbaum translates, uh, The lady unto whom, just as to death, non willingly unlocks the door. This lady is so unpleasant, just like death, and nobody really is willing to open the door for her. But Dante doesn't say only door. Dante actually says la porta del piacere, the door of pleasure. And so there is an almost erotic love. There is a sense of love. And, and some scholars have found a little bit of a inspiration coming from the Song of Songs. From, from the Bible here in this uh, love story, the way that Dante is structuring it and the way he, he really used the language to describe the love story between Francis and Lady Poverty. The way that we should read this Porta del Piacere is the door that we willingly open and uh, we also open happily to somebody from whom we expect to have some pleasure to somebody from whom we expect to have some happiness. So there is obviously a paradox here. Before his spiritual court at Coram Patre, he wed her. Coram Patre was a Latin uh, juridical expression that means in front of the bishop, so in an official church kind of context. He um, renounced all of his uh, assets and uh, earthly goods. St. Francis was the son of a fairly wealthy merchant. Uh, so he came from, uh, today we would say, from the upper class. So really, in this uh, paradoxical way, Dante loves to play with the Lady Poverty as this woman um, whom has been loved only by Jesus Christ. And uh, in between, in the 1,100 years between Jesus and St. Francis, nobody else really hugged her and made her his own uh, bride the way that Jesus Christ did. So at that purpose, it wasn't worth uh, hearing about this Amiclas, who was a poor person who helped Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar. And uh, at verse 70, Ne valse esser costante ne feroce, si che dove Maria rimane giuso. It wasn't enough, even the fact that uh, Lady Poverty, or Poverty, was so constant and dedicated that she stayed with Jesus until the last moment of his life on earth, his mortal life. This, in fact, is a, a quote that Dante did. He's uh, quoting Ubertino da Casale, who was a Franciscan, and who wrote about uh, poverty as uh, uh, somebody who, a woman who was faithful to Jesus until the last moment of, of his mortal life. This is why Dante is saying, even when Mary stayed below, the moment when Jesus was on the cross, was dying on the cross, Mary was, was there. She stayed below, meaning, in a certain sense, to compare the two women and say poverty was almost even more faithful to Jesus because she was up there with him, while Mary, Mary stayed below. And maybe it's here on, at verse 76 and 77 that this type of paradoxical love story um, is more resplendent in its, uh, in its uh, strange and weird glory. Because, Dan because St. Thomas here says, La loro concordia e loro lieti sembianti, their harmony and their glad looks, their love and wonder, is the culmination of their love story. And uh, it really sounds like uh, he is speaking about uh, a beautiful and intense love story. But once we know what exactly he is talking about, it takes a completely different uh, uh, angle and value and significance. The way Dante uses his language here to uh, express the quickness of uh, how the Franciscan order spread is uh, at verse 82, where he says, O ignota ricchezza, exclamation mark, 
o oh ben ferace, esclamation mark, scalzasi Egidio, scalzasi Silvestro, dietro lo sposo, si la sposa piace, you can, you can see here how short each word is, how the punctuation is helping the rhythm, the pace of, of these verses, and really it, this is the multiplying of uh, the various uh, followers of St. Francis that is uh, reflected in the poetry. E con, e con quella famiglia che già legava l'umile Capestro. Capestro is a very important symbol of uh, Franciscans, is this rope that was originally used um, to control oxes and horses. So this is why he has two precise meanings and why it was, uh, uh, let's say, symbolic meanings for Franciscans. One is to symbolize this inner control over instincts, uh, over animal urges, and the other one is really to symbolize humility and poverty. Then maybe uh, verse 88 requires a little bit of explanation because uh, nor did he lower his eyes in shame because he was the son of Pietro Bernardone. In fact, his name was Francesco Bernardone. Nor for the scorn and wonder he aroused um, when he was in front of Innocent, the Pope. When he was in front of Innocent, uh, he didn't behave like uh, a coward or somebody who was feeling any shame. For being the son of his father, this means uh, for being the son of a merchant who was not uh, somebody noble especially in, in those times. And so in front of the Pope, uh, being the son of a merchant would, would mean just almost being a nobody. And uh, the other reason why he would have, he could have felt a little bit of shame was because he was the founder of a mendicant order. And so they were barefoot and, and uh, certainly they were not looking great or looking elegant. Now here Dante is, is uh, summarizing for us three key moments in St. Francis' life. And these three key moments are, uh, again, shown as almost uh, the achievements of a hero. The first one um, was historically in 1209, when Pope Innocent III approved his order. For the very first time, he approved the order of the Franciscans, uh, but he did this verbally. So first, first moment and first seal, the verbal one, in 1209 by Pope Innocent III. Then in 1223, when already Franciscans were more than 5,000, 6,000, St. Francis uh, went to Pope Honorius III, who gave him his uh, written approval. Then Francis went to Egypt during a crusade and uh, with 12 of his followers, and he went with, the, among other things, the, the purpose of trying to convert the Sultan of those times. It didn't work, but uh, it says a lot about his uh, fervor. And uh, like uh, Thomas says here, la sete del martirio, the thirst for martyrdom. And finally, third moment in his life, when St. Francis was uh, on Mount uh, Alvernia, uh, and he was already towards the end of his life, where um, he received the final seal from Christ. This final seal from Christ are the stigmata, so, St. Francis died in 1226. He was about 44, 44 years old, and uh, here uh, St. Thomas says, uh, when he who destined Francis to such goodness was pleased to draw him up to the reward. Let's remember that um, in his uh, uh, Cantico delle Creature, or the Song of the Creatures, which is probably the most famous document that St. Francis has left to us, written, it's a prayer, it's a song, and it's extremely famous also because it's the f considered to be the very first document in Italian literature, written document in Italian literature. Um, in this document, St. Francis is singing about many different things, animals, creatures, etc., and also about death. As, and, she, and he calls her Sister Death in a very loving way. Uh, so this, this type of paradoxical approach, uh, or at least paradoxical towards uh, what the secular world uh, uh, thinks and sees, is reflected in the loving way that and happy way that St. Thomas described, describes his death. Death was a good thing for St. Francis in the context of his life. So he commended his most precious lady, poverty, to his brethren, to his brother, to, and 
to be faithful to her and to love her. And when returning to his kingdom, his bright soul wanted to set forth. For its body, he has no other bara or casket, really. That's what he's, what he's saying. In other words, he decided to be buried simply with his body in the earth. St. Thomas jumps to St. Dominic at verse 118, and he says, Pensa oramai qual fu lui che degno collega. They both were responsible to keep the bark of Peter on, the, on its true course. And this was our patriarch, St. Dominic. Here is where St. Thomas is reprimanding Dominicans um, because many of them are not in fact following St. Dominic. We get to the end of Canto 11 and St. Thomas has talked extremely well of St. Francis and very badly about Dominicans. Now in the next canto we'll see the opposite. This is an interesting game that Dante is playing to further highlight, to further really strengthen the point that uh, all these uh, differences um, of the Christian people should really come together as complementary in unity, in harmony. That's what he loved. Uh, so now you understand the, the meaning of uh, my reservations when in the previous canto I said uben sin pingua se non si vaneggia, refer to the Dominicans. And that's the conclusion. It's really a, a, a long narrative block here. It, we are not finished uh, with this ending, but we have to continue uh, reading Canto 12 to properly understand Canto 11. Really fascinating one, very deeply felt by Dante, because it seems like um, he had almost a soft spot for, for the Franciscan order. And, but he also loved St. Thomas very much. He was a lover of theology. And, uh, and this type of uh, harmonic way in which he presents the two orders has remained in history as one of the most famous and iconic scenes in the entire Divine Comedy in, and in Paradiso. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, we'll talk very soon for Canto 12. Thank you for watching.